Welcome to this episode of the Psychedelic Mom Podcast. I'm your host, Michaela Carlin, and I want to welcome you to part one of a two-part series that I'm doing on shadow. So I invite you to come on another journey with me. And instead of diving into the depths of the celestial heavens and the light, we're going down. We're going down into the crevices and the dark parts of ourselves that we love to keep hidden from ourselves even. So what is the shadow? In its simplest terms, the shadow is the aspects of ourselves that we're not conscious of. We're unaware of these aspects and nevertheless, they are real and they're playing out in our lives in a multiple of ways. And if you're feeling already uncomfortable (laughs) to be talking about shadow, I get it. I mean, we spend our whole lives avoiding, distracting from, disassociating from, denying the fact that we even have a shadow. Many of our behaviors of addiction, avoidance, relational patterns that aren't healthy are really the shadow at work. So why do we want to look there? (laughs) We don't. But the problem is we need to. If we want to ever become our authentic self, truly, and if we're on any journey of awakening, self-awareness, deep stages of self-realization, there is no way except through the shadow. Basically, when you think about it, you and I were born these perfect little precious beings, clean slates, other than maybe some karma, if you believe in karma, and maybe some epigenetics from our ancestral line. And there's also our DNA, and within our DNA are maybe personality aspects that we are predisposed to be stronger at, I don't know. But let's just for a second, bring the precious infant version of you to your mind's eye. Now imagine you're born into this world that is not yet fully conscious and into a family that is not yet fully conscious, a world that has a collective shadow and a family that has an integrated shadow, no fault of the world, no fault of your family. We all have shadow and believe it or not, it's not a flaw. Our shadow was our brilliance. It was our adaptive strategy to get love, to get our needs met, to get fed. And basically, if you look at it this way, that clean, beautiful, precious child came into a family in a society that had certain ideals and expectations. And at a very, very young age, even before you could talk within your family, you were noticing very adaptively, very brilliantly, the things that you got praised for, held for, loved for, the things that made your parents laugh, that got you the extra treat, that got you the extra cuddle at the end of the day. You started to notice what and who they wanted you to be. You also, at a very young age, before you could even talk, could feel the discourse, if there ever was one, the anxieties in the house. You could also feel the places that perhaps a parent pulled away from you or reprimanded you, reprised you, criticized you. You felt those. And the thing is, those caregivers are your universe. They are your survival. They are primal to your eating in the world and surviving in the world. So it's an adaptive strategy to begin to develop the personality traits and the persona that get your needs met, that get you praise and love and approval, and to disassociate from the ones that are rejected by your family 
and peers in society. So for example, let's say you grew up in a family where they believed that boys don't cry. Well, I can guarantee you, if you're a boy or a man today, there were many places in your life that the appropriate emotion was sadness and tears. But that got shoved down because you weren't allowed to do that. There was a distancing if you cried. So that emotion and sadness each time got a, suppressed into the shadows. And maybe if you did cry, the other thing that went into the shadows was maybe shame for crying. So then that gets tucked away. And it's so brilliant because it's not made conscious to us. So we don't have to deal with it. We don't even have to know that there's shame there. Let's say you're a girl and in your family, you know, girls were meant to be more compliant. And the aspects of you that were the rebel or the part of you that maybe appropriately would have spoken back or challenged, maybe that wasn't allowed. So you became incredibly agreeable throughout your life and silenced those aspects of yourself that weren't comfortable because you knew that if you acted in those ways, you would be criticized. Let's say, another example, you had a parent that was someone who was angry, a rager. What you did is you learned how to tiptoe around and stay safe. Maybe you even like put their emotions first. You could sense theirs before yours. So why is the shadow so hard to go into? That doesn't sound like a big deal to go into some memory where you felt a little afraid of a parent. Well, that's not really what happens in the shadows. What happens is the very visceral experience that you felt when you were rejected or when you were punished maybe even physically by a parent, emotionally by a parent, the visceral, survival, primal terror and fear, that's what you feel. So no wonder you don't want to go into the shadow. No wonder it feels like a scary, off-place limits. Like, can't we just talk about happy things? So when you think about we're not that different from nature, right? So if you've ever seen a tree that looks like kind of grew in all these ways that when you look at it, you kind of wonder, why did it grow that way? But if you had the history of that tree and you knew that it got hit by lightning, so it split. And to survive, it grew more this way. And that, that part of the tree trunk just kind of died off. And then it kind of turned because you don't know why, but there was a tree there at one time. So it turned to again, get the nutrients that it needed. We're like that as human beings. We have these personas and at first, when we look at ourselves and we're completely unconscious, we think, that's me. <laughs> that's who I am. But when you go a little deeper and you illuminate what's really there, what you'll see is, well, that is your persona. And underneath that persona are all these other aspects of yourself that are more authentic. So one way to start to begin to illuminate the shadow. There are many. Psychedelics are one of the best ways, I think, and this is not an endorsement of use of psychedelics due to their widespread illegality and their complexity. So if you are gonna use a psychedelic for illuminating your shadow, find a place where it's legal and do it. Find out from your doctor if it is a good thing for you and find somebody to do this in a safe place. Okay. Psychedelics are incredible at shining the light on what is not conscious. You think of mushrooms as the big decomposers. Well, they bring to the light what needs to be decomposed. Each medicine does it in different ways. And a lot of times in medicine journeys, we are purging the energetics of our child we're purging the deep emotions never felt. We are primally maybe yelling, screaming, just primal emotions that were never felt. 
And this is one way that we can go in to start to illuminate what our shadow is, but there's other ways. I just came back from a week-long meditation retreat and unbeknownst to me, (laughs) meditation retreats are a really good way to access deep shadow and feeling like the deepest, most visceral feelings that you haven't felt before. Um, So that's one way. Cultures have done it by trance and dance and music. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the conscious mind offline and all the protector parts that don't want you to go into the shadow to look. We just want to kind of soothe them and get them, get them to give us a little space and let them know that there's some parts of ourselves we want to reclaim. We want to reclaim the energy of those hidden aspects of ourselves and the parts that were underdeveloped that we know today as adults would serve us. We also can't talk about shadow work without talking about trauma. And I know that these two words, trauma and shadow, have become kind of bud- buzzwords on social media. Don't let that fool you. These are incredible ancient teachers that are brutal to feel. If anybody has ever experienced any trauma, they know that trauma gets spoken about and tossed around. But if you're really doing deep healing of trauma work or shadow work, that it's the hardest work you'll ever do. And so we can't really talk about shadow without talking about trauma because our traumas also get stored away in our shadow. Anything that was too difficult for us as children to metabolize, feel, Um, experience we went into fight flight or freeze and when we did we put that material into the unconscious and left it there so how does the shadow play out in our lives like what's the big deal why do I have to go to this gnarly dark awful place well one of the reasons is because you want to be your authentic self there is more power and sovereignty and freedom and liberation in becoming who you truly are, and it's your birthright to do so. So that's one reason. The other reason is until we heal our shadow, it's controlling us and we're projecting out into the world. I mean, look at the world today. There is a collective shadow that we're experiencing where the right and the left just project onto each other We see projections of all sorts of things out in the world and the deep shadow of someone like a Jeffrey Epstein. Um, We see all sorts of things, hate, prejudice, all of it, greed, children are starving, there's a war. This is collective shadow. So the more we can do our own individual shadow, the more we can create a world that is more conscious that is more loving, that accepts all the parts of us. Another reason to do shadow work is, as I was saying, we project it onto others. Well, we project it on to our children, our family, the people that we're in relationships with. But our shadow is really what causes ultimately our suffering. When we don't have the coherence of being our true self, we can feel that divide. And when we know, even if it's unconscious, that there is polarity within us, that there is a dark side and a light side, and this part of me that's allowed and loved and praised in this part of me, that it is too shameful to let people know, that polarity creates suffering. Our shadow creates our thinking patterns, our thoughts about ourselves, our thoughts about the world, our thoughts of separation. And until we can go into that and heal those misideas, misidentifications of who we are, we're going to suffer. So you might be scared of the shadow, but what's scarier to me is suffering and, and not having a way out, <laughs> not having actually a path, even if you want to call it the pathless path, that without doing this deep shadow work that can be incredibly painful and uncomfortable. Um, But without it, there's really kind of no, 
hope for true liberation and freedom. So the last reason I would say that it's important to do shadow work is because ultimately we can't really end our own suffering um, if we don't do it. We're going to be caught in our own thinking. Our shadow is going to be running the show. And true liberation, really, if we really look at the thinking patterns and the thoughts that come from our shadow, that would be like the part that is hypercritical of ourselves, the part that tells us, oh, you can't do that. The part that tells us we're to this, we're to that. Um, all of that faulty thinking that we're separate from other people, that we're alone, that we don't deserve love, all of those thoughts are from the shadow. So I don't really see any true liberation and freedom until all those parts come home to true self. The beauty is all of life is working in your benefit to come home to your true self, all of life. I mean, maybe even the fact that the word shadow and trauma have become so commonplace in one way, they're buzzwords, but in another way, maybe it's because it's bringing our entire shadow to the light. So just as a little bit of a review of looking at like what could be in the deep shadows of you, it could be the impulse to speak truth. Maybe that wasn't allowed in your family to share emotionally, authentically. Maybe that wasn't allowed to feel envy, rage, and shame, even though they were appropriate emotions for the particular time. Maybe you're playing out certain gender roles that don't feel authentic to you. Maybe your eroticism or sexuality has been shut down because that wasn't appropriate in your culture. Um, so there's so many things. Maybe the aspect of you that thinks you're beautiful and amazing and that believes that you can do anything that you put your mind to. Maybe that's in your shadow. Maybe the part of you that knows you are not separate from anything in life, that you are pure love and light. Maybe that's in your shadows. And if that's in your shadows, that needs to come to light. So there's some books that I think are great on shadow work. Um, one is actually first five personality patterns kind of talks about the patterning and the behavior, like the personality patterns that come out of particular um, family structures. There's a book called Presence Process that's actually kind of a meditation tool for bringing up shadow and asking questions you're definitely strong enough to go into the shadow and there's nothing there nothing there that makes you unlovable nothing and there's no part of you that has to stay hidden there's no part of you that doesn't deserve deep pure love and acceptance and so when you go into the shadow and you meet those parts of yourself hold them. Just let them know that they're loved. And they're your teachers. And also find that life force that's stuck there. And notice the places in your life that aren't really aligned to your truth. And you'll find your shadow. You'll find that you are still playing out some unhealed part of yourself. And that's okay. We want to accept that part of ourselves too. None of us are perfect, and we're in process. And it's celebrating the aspects that we've reclaimed, knowing deeply that the shadow kind of never ends, and there's deeper layers of our self and truth to come into deeper levels of self-realization, deeper levels of compassion, self-love, compassion for others, so one other reason, I guess, to do shadow work is to do no harm in the world. It's kind of the only way. Because if we're unconscious about the ways that we harm and the shadow is the unconscious, the only way to do no harm is to make our true natures known to ourselves and to take the parts 
of ourselves that would do harm and just integrate them in ways that they can be whole and healthy. So on the next part of this exploration into the shadow, I'm going to take you into your own experience of doing shadow work. <laughs> 